body topics through interviews and national thought leaders. And he also has recently completed an MBA uh, at the University of Providence, as well as a two-year executive leadership program uh, at the Health Management Academy in Washington, DC. So thank you very much for joining us. I know how busy you are, and I'm very, very excited about your lecture. Yeah, thank you very much, Leandro. And I appreciate the invitation and uh, really appreciate the fact that you enjoyed my talks because many people fall asleep during my presentation. So uh, this is a fairly complicated topic for people who aren't cholesterol geeks like myself and Leandro. So I'm going to try and make it as simple as I can. And then, uh, first of all, thanks so much for the honor of being able to present to all of you at Montefiore. That, that was an unexpected surprise, and I, I was very honored that I was invited. So I'm going to uh, briefly remind you of a little bit of lipid metabolism, and then we're going to talk about those disorders that cause high LDLs and those disorders that cause high triglycerides and or high triglycerides and high LDLs. And uh, you'll see that uh, hopefully that makes some sense as we go forward. If we have time, and I'd like to leave a little time for questions, I'm gonna to touch on the low HDL and low LDL disorders. And I, I'm just gonna point out at the very beginning, uh, I don't expect all of you to remember all of this. What I'd like to do is give you an overview and hopefully that'll stimulate you to read more. And also just to think about when you see a patient with unusual lipids, about whether you can start to make some diagnoses or refer them to the lipid clinic, but at least be aware of the implications of these lipid disorders. Now, there is a classification, the Fredrickson-Levy classification, type 1, type 2A, et cetera, that's been around for years. And I'll just tell you that we don't use this classification very much anymore. Uh, we use a, more of a, a name for the disorders that is supposed to help you with what what particles are abnormal in the blood. And that's not perfect either, but I'm gonna describe them in terms of those names. And you can see in this table, which I provided for your reference, uh, type one, type two A, two B, et cetera, and what particles are there and then what the clinical um, sequelae of those dyslipidemias are. These don't define the genetic disorder. What they define is what you're gonna see in the lipid profile and what kind of lipid particles are in the blood. So we're gonna talk about familial chylomicronemia, familial hypercholesterolemia, co familial combined dyslipidemia, familial dysbeta, familial hypertriglyceridemia, hypoalpha, and LP little a. And if that's not enough, I feel sorry for you. So the most common, and this is if you remember anything from this talk, will be the disorders of LDL because they are quite prevalent. And unfortunately, 90% of the time they're not diagnosed and that's very dangerous and I'll explain why. So familial hypercholesterolemia occurs in two forms where you inherit a bad allele from one parent. So you have one good allele and one bad one. That's called heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And if you're unfortunate enough to get a bad allele from both parents, if both parents are heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemic patients, then there's a rare disorder where you would inherit two bad alleles. And in this case, most commonly for the LDL receptor, and that's called homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. We're talking about a very common disorder where one in 250 people have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And homozygous occurs about anywhere from one in 250,000 to one in a million individuals. A very similar sister disorder is called familial defective ApoB, and that is a mutation in the gene for ApoB rather than the LDL receptor, and I'll show you that in a little more detail. And then an extremely rare disorder that looks the same, all of these cause very high LDLs with normal HDLs and triglycerides. A very rare, but uh, but much talked about disorder is a gain of function mutation, not in the gene for the LDL receptor or for ApoB, but a gain of function mutation in the gene for PCSK9. So these patients would have overproduction or overpotency of their native PCSK9 protein. And as you may all remember, PCSK9 destroys LDL receptors. 
So clinically, they have very high LDL, and they can look just like a patient who has a, a knockout mutation of their LDL receptor. And uh, hereditary beta cytosterolemia, <clears throat> completely different. But we'll talk about that, and you'll see why I threw it in here. And it's because the physical findings can look similar to FH. So on physical exam, it is occasionally mistaken for familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, not specific uh, to these disorders, but commonly seen as corneal arcus at a young age. So if you see a white ring around the cornea of the eye in somebody under 45 years old, you should think familial hypercholesterolemia. We obviously see it commonly in older people, so-called arcus senilis, but in young people, it should make you think of FH. And extender tendon xanthomas, so xanthomas on the extender surface of the hands or on the Achilles tendons are actually not on everybody with familial hypercholesterolemia, but if they're there, they're pathognomonic. So we talked about the prevalence and how rare homozygous is and um, the genetics that it's an autosomal dominant trait, uh, meaning that if you inherit a bad gene for the LDL receptor, you will have the disease and it has complete penetrance, so it doesn't skip generations. And the dose effect is the fact that if you are heterozygote, you have double your LDL levels in the blood. Why? Because half your LDL receptors don't work. If you have one bad allele and one good allele, half your LDL receptors don't work. And if you have homozygous FH, none of your LDL receptors work. So you have four times the levels of cholesterol in your blood. So to give you an idea for heterozygotes, the LDL is usually over 190. And the higher it is, the more likely the patient has the genetic disorder. So you're going to see patients with LDL of 250 and total cholesterol of 350 with normal HDL and triglycerides, lots of premature heart disease in the family. They will have to have a parent with a similar lipid profile. <clears throat> and most importantly, half of their children could potentially have the disorder because there would be a 50-50 chance that they gave their bad allele to their kids. And it's not sex linked, so it could be any of their children. I just want to show you, we talked about the physical findings and screening. And uh, let me remind you, and I flash forward because for those of you who are not lipidologists, I just want to remind you a little bit about lipid metabolism. So remember, there are two ways we get lipids into the bloodstream. One is from the diet, which would be the so-called exogenous pathway. And the other is from the, your liver's production of lipid particles, the so-called endogenous pathway. So uh, just think about this for a second. I don't want you to be torturing yourself with the slide. If you eat a Whopper, what happens? The Whopper has all kinds of things in it, but the triglycerides and cholesterol get absorbed into the intestinal mucosal cell. And because fat doesn't dissolve in water, they get packaged into a nice little spaceship. It's water soluble on the outside and fat soluble on the inside. In other words, a lipid particle. And when it comes from the gut, that particle is called a chylomicron. It's called that because the triglycerides and cholesterol are put in this phospholipid outer shell, the lipid particle, and they're picked up by the lymphatics around the gut. So it goes into the chyle and then that's dumped into the bloodstream through the thoracic duct. Now, what's unique about a chylomicron? It's got lots of triglycerides in it, 10 triglycerides for every cholesterol. So if you do a lipid profile after eating a meal without fasting, what you see is very high triglycerides. You don't see a big uh, difference in LDL. Uh, so the purpose of fasting is to avoid these chylomicrons from being in the blood. Anyway, when that particle goes through the bloodstream, the triglycerides are removed by an enzyme in the wall of the artery called lipoprotein lipase, and they're broken down into fatty acids to be used for energy. So all the capillaries have lipoprotein lipase, and all the triglyceride-rich particles go through there and donate those triglycerides as an energy source. And what's left is a smaller particle with less triglycerides that then gets a picked up by a receptor on the liver. In this case, a chylomicron remnant gets picked up by the receptor on the liver. Now your body's internal production of lipids is very similar. The liver makes a big particle 
loaded with triglycerides called VLDL. It has five triglycerides for every cholesterol. When it goes through the capillaries, the lipoprotein lipase removes the triglycerides and breaks it down for energy in the muscle. And what's left is a smaller particle with less triglycerides called an intermediate density, an intermediate density lipoprotein or IDL. And once all the triglycerides are removed, you have a particle that's predominantly all cholesterol, that's LDL, which is the waste product, has no more energy. And as you all remember, the LDL is picked up by the LDL receptor on the surface of the liver and then taken back into the liver. And what does the liver do with those particles? It removes the cholesterol and uses it to make bile and also uses the cholesterol to make new VLDL particles. So with that background, what is familial hypercholesterolemia? You get a gene that by far and away the most common is a mutation in the gene that codes for the LDL receptor from one parent. So half your LDL receptors don't work and that leads to a buildup in LDL cholesterol in the blood, basically double the normal LDL levels. And as you can imagine, that leads to a very high incidence of atherosclerosis, about 20 times the risk of a person who does not have familial hypercholesterolemia. The other potential mutation, which is much rarer, is a mutation in the gene for ApoB. ApoB is the surface protein on LDL that binds to the LDL receptor. So if your ApoB is mutated, you, the key doesn't fit into the lock. The LDL doesn't bind well to the receptor. And the net effect is the same, very high LDL in the blood. Now, as I told you, that's one in 250 people. So if you go to a restaurant, you have seen these people and I guarantee you've seen them in the clinic. The sad part is that 90% of them are not diagnosed. And even when they are diagnosed as familial hypercholesterolemia, what would be the danger? And if you think about it, if someone walks in your office with a cholesterol of 350 and an LDL of 250, I would be shocked if you didn't say, I better treat that person. So that index person is going to get treated. But what you're going to miss is the children. And those children could be dying in their 20s. And I, I have a terrible memory of a 63-year-old woman who came to my clinic who had cholesterol of 350. She was referred not for FH, but because she had statin intolerance. And uh, I, I told her that I can come up with a treatment for you for your statin intolerance, but did anybody tell you what disease you have? And she had seen multiple physicians and they told her you got very high cholesterol, that's it. So I said, you better screen your children. This is a familial hypercholesterolemia. She had three kids, two daughters in their thirties and a 28 year old son who was an army ranger. And you know she was very proud of all of them. And I said, well, they need to go immediately and get evaluated, at least with a lipid profile, because we treat kids at eight years old now with low dose statins. Um, so she did that. She told her children, her two daughters went immediately and got tested and their lipids were normal. Um, and her son said, mom, I'm an army ranger. I've had three physicals. They would have told me if my cholesterol is high. And her son had sudden cardiac death one month after that conversation. It still bothers me when I think about it. She called me to tell me that story. I've told that story a lot, but you don't wanna hear that story. So at the very least, even if you're an adult physician and don't traditionally treat, treat children, make sure that you tell the parents, please get a lipid profile on your kids. And if they're elevated, the children need to be treated early the uh, follow-up study suggests that if you wait till 18 years old to put children on a statin with familial hypercholesterolemia, about 10% of them will have a cardiac event by age 30. Whereas if you treat them at eight years old, none of them have an event by age 30. So it's very important to treat this disease early. Now, what other treatment considerations? I, first of all, I do encourage my adult treatment colleagues to treat children. The uh, statins are very safe in kids. You can use a very low dose, like 10 milligrams in a young kid who's got a cholesterol of 300 and their LDLs come down dramatically. Um, so starting around age eight, we would initiate very low dose, like 10 milligrams of atorvastatin, for example. And the clue in children is not an LDL over 190, but an LDL over 160 with a parent who also has familial hypercholesterolemia. Genetic testing has gotten inexpensive, so you can certainly do it, but it doesn't totally rule out an autosomal dominant 
inherited high cholesterol. Um, but uh, a low dose statin on children. The only other thing to keep in mind is we don't have safety data for pregnancy. There is some data giving pravastatin in the third trimester, but what do you do for a young female who will eventually want to get pregnant? And in 2022, we tell them to go off the medicine about a month before they attempt to conceive, stay off the statin until they're done nursing, and then go back on. And the only exception to that would be a young female who's already got atherosclerosis. I recently saw a 23-year-old who was a smoker. She had had a coronary stent when she was 21. She came in pregnant. Smoking, by the way, multiplies the risk many fold. And uh, so she had known coronary disease with a stent, was pregnant and on statin and a PCSK9 inhibitor. And we ended up doing LDL apheresis during her pregnancy. So the indication for LDL apheresis would be a pregnant female with established coronary disease where you would not want them untreated even for the nine months or a year of their pregnancy. So I hope that's clear. I skipped some slides because there's too much there and I get all of the information in in an hour. But think about familial hypercholesterolemia when you have patients who have a very high LDLs and a, fa a family history of premature atherosclerosis. And don't forget to screen the children. All they need is a lipid profile. They don't need anything too fancy. Now there's also a very rare uh, disorder that is not familial hypercholesterolemia, but when you order a genetic test for FH, you get the following tests. You get an LDL receptor mutation genotype, an ApoB genotype, which is just what we talked about, a PCSK9 genotype for that very rare gain of function of PCSK9 mutation. And then you get what's called the LDL RAP1 protein. And that's for this autosomal recessive hypercholesterolemia. This is about one in a million. And you can see the clathrin coated pit here with these little wrenches being the LDL receptor. I hope you can see my mouse. Um, and at the base of the LDL receptor is this anchoring protein called LDL RAP1. So this is a recessive disorder. Mom and dad won't have it, but it's if you're unfortunate enough to get a bad gene for that LDL RAP protein from both parents, the LDL receptor is tachyde and it, it can't pick up the LDL. So these patients look like homozygous FH, except their parents have normal lipids. They are very hard to treat. Their receptors don't work very well. It's extremely rare. And to this day, I'm not sure why it comes on every genetic test for familial hypercholesterolemia, other than maybe they can charge a little more for the test by doing it. But it, it is very rare. And uh, you should think of it if someone looks like they have homozygous FH, meaning LDLs uh, over 500, total cholesterol is over 1,000, unresponsive to therapy. But if their parents don't have uh, the phenotype of familial hypercholesterolemia. With that discussion, the homozygous familial hypercholesterolemics would have to be the child of two heterozygotes, and they have extremely high lipids. They usually get heart disease by 10 years old, and they need LDL apheresis early in life. They should be immediately referred to a lipid clinic. This is a homozygous FH patient. You can see how gross the tendons and tomas are, uh, and if you biopsy those, they have cholesterol in them. And this would be something you might see in the clinic in a heterozygous FH, someone who's LDLs 250 who wasn't treated till later in life. And that's a thickened Achilles tendons. And I'd just like to emphasize you have to feel the Achilles on all these patients because you often won't see these gross giant Achilles. But when you feel the Achilles, they're lumpy bumpy. And the more normals you feel, the better off you're going to be at knowing how to identify tendons and thomas in the Achilles. Again, almost pathognomonic for familial hypercholesterolemia. And this is the more common extensor tendons anthomas than one of my patients on the, on the back of the hand. And this is a heterozygous FH patient. And they just get xanthomas on the tendons that are just above the knuckles. And this you will see if you look. Only about 40% of people with FH have these physical findings. And of course, we talked about the corneal arcus, particularly at a young age. Not specific, but if you see it at a young age, it's commonly associated with FH. And xanthelasma are also seen with FH, but they can be seen with normal lipids and a whole host of other illnesses unrelated to cholesterol. 
This again is a young patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, so really high cholesterols in the thousand range. These always go to lipid clinic for either apheresis or some of the unique orphan drugs that are effective in these patients. This is a 12-year-old girl on the left with homozygous FH, and you can see the left main coronary stenosis. And on the right, a 21-year-old who has narrowing of her ascending aorta due to cholesterol buildup. Both of these patients had homozygous, the worst possible familial hypercholesterolemia. All right, so what are the takeaway points from the most common disorder? And the one thing I want you to remember from this lecture, when you start seeing LDLs 200 plus, you should think about the disease. Obviously treat those patients and think about assessing them for coronary disease, whether you use a calcium score or stress testing, but at least know they're at high risk and they should be assessed. Screen their children. There's a 50-50 chance their children have the disorder. I would suggest you consider having genetic tests in your clinic. You can get the kits for your clinic and do either saliva or a blood test, whatever you have available, and mail those kits in. The price has come down from around $1,200 for an FH genetic test to about $240 or even $190, and most insurance covers it. So it's good to have those kits in your office. The reps from any of the laboratories will be happy to deliver them to your office so that when you're suspicious, you can send, the, send off the testing. And one final caveat, we know that there are groups of SNPs that can gather together and cause very high LDLs and the patient can look and act just like familial hypercholesterolemia and you may not see an, a positive genetic test. It's still important to treat those patients. If the genetic testing is negative, instead of 22 times the risk, they have six times the risk, which is bad enough, right? And uh, so you want to aggressively treat those people with LDLs over 190 and get their LDLs under control. And of course, if they have any sign of atherosclerosis, get them below 70. All right, so let's tackle a little more complicated subject, which are the genetic disorders of triglycerides. We're gonna cover the chylomicronemia syndrome, which is the worst. Remember I told you that chylomicrons have 10 triglycerides to every cholesterol. So if you have a disorder where you can't metabolize chylomicrons, you're gonna have remarkably elevated triglycerides. And what's the sequelae of that? Frequent episodes of pancreatitis. That's a devastating disorder. Then we'll cover what's fairly common, familial combined dyslipidemia, which is almost like diabetic dyslipidemia on steroids and familial hypertriglyceridemia, fairly rare, has a, the concern about pancreatitis, but minimal risk for coronary disease. And then finally, type three. So when we look at triglycerides in the old days, and this is even before my time, as old as I am, believe it or not, you'd spin the uh, blood down, leave it in a refrigerator overnight. And if it had that white supernatant on the right, it was chylomicrons. If it was turbid throughout, like the middle, it's not a great picture. Then there was VLDL particles in it. And if it was clear, it was normal. Uh, thank God we don't do that anymore. Now, high triglycerides due to anything can cause these what are called tuberoeruptive xanthomas. They, they, look like, they look like pimples, but if you biopsy them, they have triglycerides in them. They can occur on the abdomen, on the rear end, on the elbows, and they, they're seen in every severe hypertriglyceridemia. That doesn't tell you the disorder. Here's another example on the trunk. This patient has chylomicronemia. You can also get lipemia retinalis with this kind of creamy color, pink color looking uh, blood vessels in the eyes due to triglyceride deposition in the retinal arteries. All right, so what is chylomicronemia? As you recall, I told you that chylomicrons are broken down by lipoprotein lipase in the endothelium, which removes the triglycerides. So if you might guess, if you inherit a bad gene for the lipoprotein lipase, you can't break down chylomicrons. This is a recessive disorder. So you have from both parents a mutation in the gene for lipoprotein lipase. You can't remove the chylomicrons. So you get a buildup of chylomicrons in the blood. And what do you think your triglyceride to cholesterol ratio is? 10 times. So you see 5,000 triglycerides, cholesterol of 500. Now you might ask, well, what about VLDL? 
why would they just get chylomicrons elevated? Because lipoprotein lipase also removes VLDL. And just because I want you to become lipid geeks, the reason you don't see the VLDL uh, increase is because there's another lipase on the liver. Here it's diagnosed, I mean, it's shown as HDTL, hepatic triglyceride lipase. And that lipase can handle VLDL pretty well. So the VLDL can go to the liver in the absence of lipoprotein lipase and be fairly well metabolized by hepatic triglyceride lipase. But chylomicrons have a very poor affinity for the liver lipase. So they remain in the blood, hence very high levels of chylomicrons and triglycerides. Now, what happens to these people? Well, if they do have, uh, again, recessive, so if they inherit both alleles from the parents, they have extremely high uh, triglycerides and recurrent pancreatitis. And if they eat anything with fat, remembering that chylomicrons are made in the gut, they exacerbate with pancreatitis. Their parents are carriers with only one allele, not both. They're heterozygotes. They might have just a mild hypertriglyceridemia or normal lipids, but they don't have the pancreatitis. So if you look at what are the most common mutations, and uh, again, just for the sake of time, there are four other genes that affect metabolism of triglycerides and that are necessary for lipoprotein lipase to work. APOC2, GPI, HBP1, APOA5, and LMF1. Those are much more rarely the cause of chylomicronemia. So uh, I don't want to dwell on that. That's a lecture in itself. But uh, any one of those other mutations associated with one allele with lipoprotein lipase deficiency, or any two of these gene mutations that occur together in a recessive uh, fashion can cause chylomicronemia. But you can see that 95% of patients have two alleles with mutations for lipoprotein lipase. Now, we have never had good therapies before. Uh, so you have to put these people on unbelievably restrictive diets, less than 10% of calories from fat. I have one patient, if she eats a chicken breast, she's okay. But if she has one chicken leg, she comes in with acute pancreatitis, just that little bit of extra fat. So it's a, it's a miserable lifestyle. Often they develop uh, chronic pain in the abdomen. They have trouble keeping a job. My patients have had 20 to 30 episodes of pancreatitis over a several year period. And uh, despite trying their best with diet, frequently come back in. Many of our drugs that we use for lowering triglycerides work by activating lipoprotein lipase. And so that unfortunately doesn't work when the lipoprotein lipase is broken. You can reduce, you can increase lipoprotein lipase that's broken, it still doesn't work. So more recently, they by accident found that a drug that uh, removes ANCH-PTL3, which you can see here is an inhibitor of lipoprotein lipase, somehow works for chylomicronemia and lowers the, the triglycerides by about 80%, which has been a godsend. This is one of the few lipid disorders that keeps lipidologists up at night because every few weeks the patients come in with pancreatitis and none of the drugs work and it's very frustrating. So this ANCH-PTL3 inhibitor seems to work and we don't know why. It probably has nothing to do with removing inhibition on lipoprotein lipase. It may have more to do that that particular protein also downregulates certain receptors on the liver. And when it's removed, it allows the chylomicrons to be cleared more by the liver. So that's, a, that's a, still a discussion for debate. So how do you know chylomicronemia? Extremely high triglycerides, usually presenting at a relatively early age in childhood or adolescence, recurrent pancreatitis, refractory hypertriglyceridemia. In other words, despite all the drugs, the triglycerides don't come down. Doctors get very frustrated if they don't know the disorder. And the most important thing is put this patient on a good low, low fat diet. And I just wanna point out one potential danger here for you to think of in the back of your mind. If you have recurrent pancreatitis, what does that lead to? You know, other than misery, it leads to diabetes, right? So eventually the pancreas burns out and you get diabetes. So we have a disorder where increasing fat in the diet is disastrous. But what do you tell somebody who needs a diabetic diet? So if the patient has developed diabetes because of having chylomicronemia, and they go to your usual dietitian, they're going to put them on a diabetic diet, which is carbohydrate restricted and more liberal in fat. And that's going to make them worse. So that's why you always want to know what came first. 
the diabetes or the pancreatitis. And if they had high triglycerides and pancreatitis that led to a burnt out pancreas, then you want to be careful to have them see a nutritionalist who's familiar with dilemicronemia syndrome rather than take the chance of making them worse by having them put on a diabetic diet. Now, if they had diabetes first and they added alcohol and other things, then maybe they don't have the, the so-called monogenic chylomicronemia syndrome. So another syndrome that looks similar is someone who's obese and who drinks too much and got a hemoglobin A1C of 12, and all of a sudden they come in with severe hypertriglyceridemia and pancreatitis. What's the difference? They didn't have it recurrently at birth. There are other mitigate other additional factors such as obesity, diabetes, et cetera, predisposing them to high triglycerides and they respond to drug therapy, which chylomicronemias don't. So phenofibrate, fish oil uh, significantly lowers their triglycerides. Um, and that helps you separate the so-called pure chylomicronemias, monogenic chylomicronemias from what we would call multifactorial chylomicronemia, which is just a stars all in alignment of a lot of different disorders that lead to severe hypertriglyceridemia. Okay, what's the next one? This one's a little more common. It's sort of like diabetic dyslipidemia on steroids. There's a lot of discussion if this is even really a disease. It's called familial combined dyslipidemia. It's probably more than one disorder. But the main thing that, that uh, kicks it off is a genetic predisposition to overproduce ApoB100. Remember that for every ApoB, there's a lipid particle. So if I'm holding a bucket of cholesterol and I put two ApoBs in there, I'm going to get two large particles. But if I put 100 ApoBs in that same bucket, I'm going to get 100 smaller particles. And we know that the smaller, more numerous particles lead to atherosclerosis. So these patients produce a lot of smaller VLDL particles that get uh, metabolized into LDL. They have high risk of atherosclerosis. And what's interesting is, depending on the rest of their metabolism, they can have all different lipid profiles. So the clue is that their ApoB level is higher than their LDL, if you test for it. But one patient may drive all of these particles to LDL and have just a high LDL. The next patient may uh, have too much VLDL and not be able to move it into intermediate and low density. So they would have high triglycerides and some would have both high triglycerides and high LDL. It is an autosomal dominant trait. It's an overproduction syndrome, but downstream the metabolism can change the phenotype. So one of your, your mom might have high LDL, you might have high triglycerides, your kid might have both. And the clue is premature heart disease in the family, which is not the case with chylomicronemia. They don't get heart disease. And secondly, that if you draw an ApoB level, it's higher than the LDL. And you're going to see numbers that are quite high. So LDL 160, 170, and some patients, triglycerides 4, 500, um, but a lot of heart disease in the family and a lot of dyslipidemia. The treatment works. So you're going to end up treating these people with statins because they're at risk for atherosclerosis and as needed with triglyceride lowering drugs if they have significant hypertriglyceridemia. Again, the clue is an ApoB level higher than the LDL. This is very common in certain countries. In fact, in Mexico, it's extremely common. And there isn't a single mutation that leads to this that's been described yet. Um, there are a lot of discussions about multiple SNPs that can lead to this disorder. Again, bringing up the issue of, is it a real disorder? Okay, what about familial hypertriglyceridemia? This is also a high triglyceride disorder, but the problem is not making too many particles, it's that you make large VLDL particles, and the numbers are actually not increased. So what do you think the triglyceride to cholesterol ratio is? Five to one, you remember there's five triglycerides in every uh, VLDL compared to cholesterol. So you get about five times the triglyceride level of the cholesterol, which is not quite as high as chylomicronemia, but still can cause pancreatitis. And because you don't have too numerous particles, you have very minimal increased risk for coronary disease. So as opposed to familial combined, where you have high ApoB levels, lots of particles, and high risk for coronary disease, familial hypertriglyceridemia seems to have minimal increased risk. Now, how would you tell the two apart? This follows the name. 
everyone in the family has high triglycerides, unlike familial combined, where it could be one high, one low, one LDL high. Uh, every person, the, whichever parent you got this dominant trait from has high triglycerides around five times their cholesterol. And you can see it in every generation that person shows up with a lipid profile that shows they have the exact same thing, high triglycerides. And when you do a family history, you have smattering of pancreatitis, but not much cardiovascular disease. So that's familial hypertriglyceridemia. We don't have an easy genetic test for that, but clinically it's pretty easy to diagnose. And the last one is type three or so-called so familial dysbeta lipoproteinemia. This one's a bit confusing, um, but it shouldn't be. You have to have two disorders. So it's rare, about one in 10,000 people. You have to have a combination of overproduction syndrome, like familial combined dyslipidemia, or obesity or diabetes, where you're making too many lipid particles, and a mutation in APOE, a so-called E2E2 phenotype, and I'll explain that in a second. There is an increased risk for coronary artery disease, and what's interesting, it's very diet sensitive. If I have time, I'll tell you a quick story about that. This is type three is the only, and we call this type three in the Levy classification, which I told you we don't use anymore. Why? Because it's just easier to say than familial dysbeta lipoproteinemia. So we, out of laziness, we call it type three. But this is the only lipid disorder where the physical findings are on the palms rather than on the extensor surfaces. So what happens? You see the intermediate density lipoprotein has an APOE on it. And I, I didn't talk about this. I showed you that the intermediate density lipoprotein gets broken down by lipoprotein lipase or HDL and forms an LDL without any triglycerides, but it can also go directly back to the liver and bind via APOE, this is called the shunt pathway. And when it does that, it's metabolized by the liver lipase, the hepatic triglyceride lipase to remove the triglycerides. So with type three, it starts with a mutation in APOE, so-called E2E2 mutation. And that makes this particle bind very weakly on the surface of the liver. Now, if that's the only problem, it actually sits here for a while and gets fully metabolized by hepatic triglyceride lipase, and your risk for heart disease is actually lower. But if you add something that increases VLDL production, whether that be obesity or diabetes or familial combined dyslipidemia, now you get a log jam where you can't clear the intermediate density lipoprotein and having a high level of IDL in the blood leads to atherosclerosis. So again, it's some overproduction of ApoB, either diabetes, obesity, familial combined dyslipidemia has to be present on top of the genetic mutation of ApoE2E2. And what happens is you build up very high amount of these intermediate density lipoproteins in the blood. How would you diagnose that? Well, believe it or not, they have an equal cholesterol and triglyceride level. VLDL, five to one triglyceride to cholesterol. These IDLs have one to one. So this is the only disorder where a clue on the lipid profile would be an equal triglyceride and cholesterol. 300 cholesterol, 300 triglycerides. Your eyes should open up. Maybe it's a type three. And you can do APOE genotyping. And if they have E2E2, then it's highly likely this is what they have. The caution there is some patients will come back with E4, E4, which as you know, has potential for Alzheimer's disease. So before you just send people off for genetic testing, you better be prepared that that patient might get mad at you and say, I didn't want to know I'm at risk for Alzheimer's. So when you're doing APOE genotyping, you may want to do counseling with the patient or genetic counseling before you order the test, and they may choose not to get it done. These are orange palmer creases. If you biopsy them, guess what? They're intermediate density lipoproteins. Looks like somebody drew your lifeline with an orange uh, you know, marker. And um, the other thing you can see is xanthomas on the palms of the hands. These are a couple of little xanthomas in type three. Again, the only lipid disorder where the findings are in the palms. One good thing about this is extremely diet sensitive. So if you put someone on a low carb, low fat diet, the lipids get much better, which is not true with the others. All right, we have just a few minutes to cover low HDL. I'm gonna do that quickly because these are extremely rare disorders. 
<clears throat> the one that gets the most press is A1 Milano. We'll talk about that. Don't forget a low HDL is often due to other things than genetic disorder, smoking, central obesity, insulin resistance, other medications, chronic inflammatory disorder. So always think about secondary causes when you see a low HDL. But the syndromes include ones that you don't produce enough HDL. Hypoalpha lipoproteinemia is a mutation in uh, ApoA1 where you don't make uh, HDL, and it is actually a dominant trait. And those people have very low HDLs and have a lot of heart disease in the family. So one way you can separate out from who to worry about and who not to have just isolated low HDL with otherwise normal lipids, what's the family history? If they have a strong family history of atherosclerosis, you're going to worry about them as an underproduction syndrome, which is a dominant trait called familial hypoalpha lipoproteinemia. HDL migrates to the alpha location and electrophoresis. That's where the name comes from. Then there's the A1 Milano gene, which was discovered just in a little town outside of Milan called Lumona Sildarda in Italy from a mutation that they've actually traced back to the original two parents who had a spontaneous mutation. And um, that has low HDL, but not because they don't make enough. They make plenty, but it has rapid turnover. And it also is very effective in removing cholesterol from the peripheral tissues. So they have low steady state levels, but they make a lot. They just metabolize it quickly and they don't get atherosclerosis. And we've tried for years to come up with a artificial A1 Milano uh, to try and make that type of HDL to see if it'll be anti-atherogenic. So they won't have a family history, even though they have a low HDL of premature atherosclerosis. And then there's two rare syndromes. And again, I'm going over them quickly. These are extremely rare. Tangier's disease that was described in a child on Tangier Island. They have an ABCA1 deficiency, so they can't move cholesterol from the peripheral tissue like the foam cell. They can't move it out of the foam cell and into an HDL. And they can't move it out of bone marrow and other tissues. These people have swollen tonsils with cholesterol buildup in the tonsils and the tonsils look orange, often caused, called orange tonsil disease with tangiers. And the other is called fish eye disease, which is LCAT deficiency. They can move the cholesterol out of the tissues, but they can't esterify the cholesterol. And cholesterol has to become cholesterol ester to go into the, the belly of the HDL. So in other words, they never make fully mature HDL, either because it can't pick up cholesterol or because the cholesterol can't be moved into the center of it. So both of these cause very low uh, HDLs. And these are extremely rare. And these are sick people in general. LCAT deficiency is called fish eye disease because it makes the cornea look cloudy like you might see in a fish. So just remember that the hypoalpha, where you'd have apparently healthy patient with lots of relatives with premature atherosclerosis and first order relatives with same thing, isolated low HDL, usually less than 25. And again, I told you that was due to an A1 mutation so they don't make mature HDL. And I'm gonna skip through these because I wanna, this is a planar xanthoma. It looks like the Texas, the state of Texas. It's kind of a light colored flat xanthoma. This is a blood draw, that's not the xanthoma, but you can see the, the light colored xanthoma here. And that is classic for hypoalpha, for an ApoA1 mutation where they don't make HDL associated with a high risk of coronary disease. Okay. Skipping through these for the sake of time. Again, uh, for Tangiers, you don't have that transport protein to move cholesterol out of the macrophage, so you don't make mature HDL, the HDL levels stay low, and you get a buildup of fat in, the, in your tissues, including the tonsils, the bone marrow, the muscles, et cetera. And the orange swollen tonsils are classic for Tangiers on every board exam. And then the uh, LCAT deficiency, uh, again, uh, inability to esterify cholesterol, which has to happen. Cholesterol esters required for the cholesterol to go into the HDL and make the HDL a mature particle. So in the absence of that, you have low HDL and you can get the so-called fish eye disease. And the last thing I'll just touch on, and then we'll, the last five minutes, I'll peel a little egg, is uh, 
the low LDL syndromes. We never talk about this. And those are called hypobeta lipoproteinemia because the beta uh, is the location where LDL migrates on an electrophoresis plate. So people always ask me, you know, what's the most common side effect of having a very low LDL? It's the same as the most common side effect of being on a statin, which is longevity. So in general, when the LDL is very low, you do great. Um, for whatever reason, there are, been, there are some very rare situations where uh, having a low LDL is associated with inability to allow cholesterol to be secreted from the liver and triglycerides. So you get fatty liver and potential steatohepatitis and cirrhosis. But in general, if a patient walks in your office and looks healthy with a very low LDL, you can suggest they get a bottle of champagne as their risk of atherosclerosis is really low. Now, if they have the rare disorder, A-beta lipoprotein, so hypo means they have low amount of LDL, A-beta lipoprotein would be no ApoB containing lipoprotein. Those people are sick. They can't absorb water-soluble vitamins. They have all kinds of neurological and other disorders, and they're sick from birth. They won't come walking in your office. So the total absence or A-beta lipoproteinemia is bad for you. Hypo-beta in general is protective with the exception of those rare individuals that get steatohepatitis with it. Hypo-beta is due to a, a ApoB mutation and uh, that mutation leads to a reduction in secretion of ApoB containing lipids from the liver. Whereas A-beta is uh, my microsomal triglyceride transport protein. Uh, mutation, absent MTP. And as I mentioned, they're sick. They have spinal cerebral, retinal de degeneration, vitamin deficiencies, and they are sick. They don't walk in your office. Both of those are very rare. So let's finish with LP little a because this is on the horizon and it's important. What is LP anything? LP is the intact lipid particle, and what's in parentheses is the apoprotein on the surface. So LP little a looks like an L, a LDL particle. It's got predominantly cholesterol inside, a little bit of triglycerides. It has an ApoB100 on it, but it also has Apo little a. And so the intact structure is called LP little a. Now, who cares, you might say. Well, that apo little a, where the way it's bound to the lipid particle is highly oxidized. And the surface of LP little a particles are loaded with oxidized moieties. So you remember that oxidation is a stimulator of inflammation. When an oxidized lipid particle is in the wall of the artery, it promotes atherosclerosis. The other thing is the apo little a has an amino acid sequence that looks very much like plasminogen. And we believe that the apo little a may inhibit plasminogen going to plasmin, which is our natural anticoagulant, right? So if you inhibit plasminogen going to plasmin, you also get increased risk of thrombosis. So what happens when you inherit this dominant disorder of elevated LP little a? You have early bypass graft closure, thrombosis of stents early, and rampant atherosclerosis, the double whammy of increased inflammation as well as increased thrombosis. In case you're interested, it's on chromosome number six. It, it occurs in 20% of the population, so it's common to have high elevated LP little a. It's dominant, so it will run in families, and uh, it increases the risk based on how high the LP little a levels are for atherosclerosis. So, you know, hopefully you'll all have an opportunity to get these copies of these slides. If you want them, I'll be more than happy to send them. But LP little a, this is a more stylized picture. You see the oxidized phospholipid uh, increase in inflammation and chemotaxis of you know, inflammatory cells to the area where this particle might be lodged in the wall of the artery, as well as the prothrombotic uh, component of it uh, leading to increased thrombosis. Not good for atherosclerosis. Now this is very common and people aren't dropping every day. One in five people aren't dropping dead of heart attacks. So I think we have to learn a little bit more about what is the milieu in a patient with high LP little a that's gonna be particularly dangerous and particularly predispose them to atherosclerosis. Uh, 
This is genetically determined. Your blood levels stay the same throughout life. And you all know that statins don't lower it. PC net SK9 inhibitors can lower it maybe 20, 25%. Whether that leads to better outcomes is conjecture. You know, doing some math on the results of the PCSK9 study suggests that maybe if the, that they do lower your LP little A, you may get better outcomes. But the good news is for the first time, we have studies in development, drugs in development that lower it about 80%. So there's going to be a lot of talk about this in the near term as those drugs get closer to release. And we're in the middle of outcome trials to see if lowering LP little A actually reduces risk of heart disease. And for those of you who may be very excited about LP little A, we still have to prove that it's a target of therapy, not just a risk factor. If you remember, horizontal earlobe graces are associated with a higher risk of coronary disease. But I'm gonna tell you right now that if you cut off the earlobe, you're not gonna change the risk. So we still have the unfortunate dilemma of having to prove that something that's a predictor of heart disease is also a risk factor, or is also a target of therapy. But LP little a fits the bill for having all the physiologic reasons to be a good target of therapy. So what do we do in 2022? We, know, we remember two things. It is a dominant trait, so it runs in families. If you have someone where you put them on a statin and their LDL doesn't come down, think about LP little a because it's sometimes measured as LDL and statins don't lower it. And so in those patients where you can't believe that, that statin didn't lower their LDL, it's worth thinking about getting an LP little a. It increases the risk of progression of aortic stenosis also. So if you have a patient with aortic stenosis, it's worth getting an LP little a. If it's elevated, what you should be doing now until we have more data is getting more frequent echoes, maybe every six months instead of every year. It's an acute phase reactant, so don't order it when someone has pneumonia because it will be elevated. Uh, it is an autosomal dominant trait. And in 2022, as well as when I made this slide in 2017, <laughs> the treatment is to get the LDL very low and modify all the other risk factors. But more to come in the very near term because we're going to have more evidence about whether lowering LP little a with some of these drugs on the horizon will actually reduce risk but be aggressive, get the LDL 20 or 30 points below where you normally would if they have elevated LP little a. Niacin, we're never gonna know. It has got does more harm than good in most patients, so we kind of dropped that. And as I mentioned, we have the APO little a antisense therapy on the horizon. So we talked about chylomicronemia, familial hypercholesterolemia and defective ApoB, familial combined dyslipidemia, dysbeta, familial hypertriglyceridemia, low, HDL syndromes, hypoalpha lipoproteinemia, and finally LP little a. And with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you even very my, much. Even <laughs> my son can figure this out. By the way, he, he's a financial analyst now. That's an old picture. All right, I will stop. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. What a, a great lecture. Um, it's a, such a complex topic, but I think you made it a very interesting and, and very dynamic. And I think it's perfect, the part of lipoprotein A, it, for those that are interested in it, we would also have Dr. Simikas next, in February, talk about it for a full hour. So, you uh, couldn't have anybody better, Sam Simikas is, uh, you know, this is, he's the world expert on this. So that should be a great talk. I wouldn't miss it. And so let's go with the questions. So a lot of questions about it. Uh, so I'll start with this one. Uh, are there any gene therapies in the horizon? In particular, I think with the development of, of CRISPR and all the this technology, how it's pushing the field. And we've had a lecture here uh, from the new therapies for lowering LDL from Verb. Uh, any any of these may be used for these genetic diseases in the next decades. Yes. So uh, first of all, the big, uh, the big options that are coming very soon, and some are already there, are small inhibiting RNA. So we, as you know, we have glycerin already available for heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and people with refractory LDL elevation uh, who also have atherosclerosis. And so that's a small inhibiting RNA that goes into the hepatocyte and turns on an RNase that destroys the messenger RNA for, for uh, PCSK9. And that has a six month duration. We have the antibodies against PCSK9, but what's coming and what has just started human trials 
It's very early, so we have to see the safety is a gene editing CRISPR drug that goes in and actually puts a missense mutation into the gene for PCSK9. So uh, what it does is it gives you lifelong PCSK9. And once it puts a missense mutation in the DNA for PCSK9 or in the gene, the messenger RNA only goes like a tiny bit and then hits a bump and falls away and gets destroyed. So uh, they just started human studies within the last couple of months in New Zealand, and we'll have to see if it's safe. And then how would you market something like that? It's one shot for life, but we'll let somebody else worry about that. But I, I think it, it's exciting. So yes, uh, CRISPR has hit at least the heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia uh, opportunity with that PCSK9 inhibiting drug. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Rob Osfeld, our director of preventive cardiology. Uh, he actually asked, asked it last time and I, I didn't read it properly. So I think he, he, he told me about it. So again, so for a given LDL cholesterol serum level, does the toxicity of the LDL cholesterol particle vary by di dietary pattern? Example, plant-based versus animal-based. You know, that's a great question. So um, if you look at observational data in terms of what seems to be the best diet for inflammation, which correlates with atherosclerosis, a pure plant-based diet seems to be the best. Whether you're looking at HSCRP or uh, TNF alpha or any marker of inflammation. The least inflammatory is a low sugar plant based diet, based again on observational data without a randomized controlled trial. Um, the thing I would just point out regarding diet is that chylomicronemia remnants are atherogenic. And for years, we've known that after a fatty meal, you have circulating very dangerous lipid particles. And we don't measure that because we wait 12 hours to look at a fasting lipid profile. And what we're measuring is uh, your liver's production at baseline. And though over many months that can be affected by your diet, that's more of your endogenous lipid production. So what am I getting at? If you look at all the lipid lowering trials where we use drugs to lower lipids, clearly on a statin versus not, those patients do better. But then if you look at the group who are on a statin and say, was there any difference between the people who had the best outcomes versus those who still had recurrent events despite being on the statin? And this was done 25 years ago. The percent saturated fat in the diet is the only differentiator. So when people say, is it okay if I have pizza now because my cholesterol is beautiful on my drug therapy? The answer is your best outcomes are going to be including a low saturated fat on top of cholesterol lowering medicines. The medicines don't alleviate the risk because they take care of your baseline endogenous lipid production, but they don't take care of the postprandial lipemia you get when you eat a high saturated fat meal. So I'm not sure if that exactly answers the question, but, and then finally do antioxidants orally, avocados and other things they do. And the test tube change the oxidation levels of lipid particles, but, you know, in terms of outcome data on on that, uh, we, we still got more work to do. That's very good. Thank you very much. Uh, so a uh, question from our fellows. Thanks for uh, such a great talk. Can you speak a bit more on your approach for assessing for coronary disease in asymptomatic patients with a phage? Do, should we do periodic CCTA without symptoms? That's a tough one, you know, because there isn't a ton of data. So we have that dictum that if you have a zero calcium score, you have almost a zero 10 year risk. Um, the power of zero as it's labeled. Uh, the people that break that rule, in my humble opinion, are smoking FH patients. So I have had a couple of young females who smoked heavily who had FH and who had zero calcium scores, but on CT angio were found to have severe uh, multivessel disease and underwent bypass surgery. That's a rare event. So I am a big believer in asymptomatic FH patients and a calcium score. Amit Kara uh, uh, down at uh, UT Southwestern has published that doing calcium scores in younger individuals with FH can really predict risk. You might see calcium in a 25-year-old so even though we don't traditionally get them in an FH patient, you might. 
So I do calcium scoring with reckless abandon in FH patients. And if they're zero, but they've been a smoker, I keep my eyes and ears open for any symptoms. And if there's any symptoms, I do a CTA. But because of the radiation dose of CTA, I don't jump to CTA on everybody. Um, symptoms trump everything. And they certainly trump very low calcium scores. But in a non-smoker with a zero score, you got pretty pretty good evidence that they're going to do well. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and so there's a question from Jay Chudo, one of our cardiologists, that says you, you mentioned the, the exam and you had all those beautiful pictures from, from patients. So in, in what patients should we be looking at their Achilles tendon or should we be doing an, an extended physical exam? How do you pick which patients you do this on? I think if you see an LDL over 190, um, and so they would be in, on no therapy, right? Or someone who maybe their LDL still 180 and they're on 80 of atorvastatin, so you can predict they had very low levels before they were started. Uh, you should have them make a fist and look at their extensor tendons and feel their Achilles and take a look at their eyes for corneal arcus. There are a lot of reasons to do it. Only about a third of people with FH will actually have those physical findings. But for example, if you're thinking about a PCSK9 inhibitor, you, you, you need to note that because when you're doing the clinical criteria for FH, the Dutch criteria, um, those xanthomas really increase the risk of them having the disease. And that may help you in terms of uh, getting approval for the appropriate drug therapy in those people. And also it makes the diagnosis, period. You probably don't need the genetic testing in those patients. Um, but I, my fellows and residents get used to everybody with LDLs in the 190 plus range to examine, take that extra two minutes, look at their eyes, their knuckles and their ankles. Thank you very much. And so you said the 190 for the LDL for uh, to think about FH as is recommended. And what about from Seth Sokol, what about LPLA? He says, what is really abnormal in, in LPLA? There are different labs, different units, different ethnicities, what's abnormal? Yeah, so you'll see the normal ranges and it's really important with LPLA to look at what units it's been measured in because some labs measure it in milligrams per deciliter. And now we think it's better to measure it in animals per liter. There's no conversion, that's the first thing. They, they measure two different things. Milligrams per deciliter measures how much cholesterol is in LPLA particles. So it's similar to LDL cholesterol, whereas nanomoles per liter give you a better idea of the number of particles and, and that correlates better with risk. But traditionally, when you look at the risk curves, where do the numbers go up? Milligrams per deciliter, they say over 27 is abnormal, but it's 50 where you see that inflection point where it really takes off. So uh, milligrams per deciliter over 50 would be of concern. And for nanomoles per liter, uh, they say over 75 is abnormal, but when they get up over 100, that's when we start you know, th getting more concerned about an increased risk. I do believe we're gonna learn more about this, that not everybody with high LPLA is as, as high a risk as others. The number itself isn't the only risk predictor, but th there's a, a lot more to learn about it. And if you want to see a synopsis of all of the scientific data, the Lipid Association published a consensus uh, document about a year and a half, two years ago. And if you go to lipid.org and look at consensus documents, uh, pull, pull down menu, you can take a look at it. And it's very thorough. And I know Sam, who is going to speak next week, he, he will give you the, every detail about it. Yeah, every detail in, in February, but... So thank you very much. I think this is hopefully, you know, it's a, I know it's a lot for people that are not that interested in lipids, but at least will make people think uh, and when to refer and when to, to look more into this if they're interested. Yeah, I hope so too. I don't expect everyone. It took me many presentations and having to, having to teach it to start to learn it. Um, and I will tell you that not every patient fits into one of these neat little boxes, even if you knew everything that I just presented. The more we do genetic testing, the more we realize that um, a lot of our dictums about what causes genetic disease aren't always true. For example, we see chylomicronemia patients that are classic recurrent pancreatitis that before we did genetic testing, we'd say we know they have lipoprotein lipase mutation. 
and we find out that some of them have a group of SNPs that we can't actually do on routine genetic tests. The genetic tests are negative, but when you do more detailed gene-wide analysis, you find out they have clusters of SNPs that affect their triglycerides. And we're still learning about that, and we can't even test for it in a lot of patients. And FH, it's the same. Not everybody who looks like FH clinically has an LDL receptor mutation. So what I hope you'll do is at least get interested and think about these disorders. Don't miss the familial hypercholesterolemia. That's the one you're most likely going to see in your clinic. And if you miss it, the kids are going to die. So please don't do that. Thank you very much. We can end with that. That was an amazing lecture. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Have a great day and good luck.